So next. Um, so <coughs> what I want to talk about next, so he, he talks then in this next chapter four about um, the difference between cries and articulations, right? And he says that cries of passion um, are natural and articulations are conventional, right? And what he means when he says articulation, he really means like, so you, you, you can kind of imagine, you know, you know an, an animal has these cries, right? You know, like the howl of a wolf or the bark of a dog. It's just, it's just sort of, uh, un, well, it's, it's sound, it's sort of continuous sound, right? And in order to create language out of it, you have to create articulations, which is to say you have to, to create some interruptions in that sort of flow of, of, of sound. Right? And so that's what articulation means, is to create these kinds of interruptions in that flow. Right? So in order to create words out of a, as a scream, you need, you need consonants. Right? So a scream is kind of like a, like a, a pure vowel, I guess you could say. Right? You know, ah, right? it's, just, it's an, a vowel. Right? And if, in, in order to turn that into a word, you need to add some consonants. Right? Um, and that's articulation. Is it interrupts that flow of sound, right? And that's what he's looking at when he looks at this movement from cries to articulation, right? So, th so the claim he makes is that um, cries are natural, and articulation is not natural because it, it requires attention and practice, right? And so, yes, it does, right? But, and he, he points to the example. So he's got the evidence. He says all children need to learn them, right, these articulations, and some do not succeed easily. So it's, it's not really easy to learn articulation, right? You know, it's like when you're, when you're a toddler learning language, you, you kind of screw things up. You get the consonants mixed up. You get the vowels sort of mixed up. And, and right, it's, 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 it takes work, right? And so he's saying, well, because, we, because of that, we see that in children, that's our evidence for saying, oh, articulation requires attention and practice, and it's something that's not natural, but that has to be learned, right? Um, and then he also sort of refers to, you know, examples of, of words in which the liveliest exclamation, exclamations are inarticulate. So when you're, you know, when you're crying out in pain, you don't have the, the careful articulation of you. You don't have lots of syllables and things. You just have this scream, right? And that's what he calls the natural kind of language, right? Um, <coughs> so, um, so the, he doesn't provide us with an explicit warrant here. Um, his, uh, um, but, um, but what I'm kind of indicating as his warrant is that he sees this idea of articulation as the way in which language develops from um, from cries um, into words with consonants and distinctions and relationships. So it's really similar to that. Um, I guess you could say that the warrant is really a continuation of what we just said about how language begins as passion and turns into a kind of rationality, which is to say that initial passion is the cry, right? And then as you become rational, you, you, you work hard, you pay attention, and you, and you, can, you, you add these articulations to the crawl, you add the consonants, and you add sort of the, the sort of the, uh, the different distinctions and and relationships um, that need to develop in order for you to have a real language. Yeah. So, um, so that's that's kind of his starting point, and that, I think that's the overall framework with which he's approaching the development of language, and then. Um, He emphasizes this again in the way in which he talks about how language again, the first language, he, he gives this, this picture or this description of, of, of the first language and how it must have been. Right? And he says that um, the first tongue, if it still existed, would retain the original characteristics that would distinguish it from all others. So you know, there's these special ways it would, it would be. And he says, not only would all the forms of this tongue have to be in images, feelings, and figures, but even its mechanical part, uh, even in its mechanical part, it would have to correspond to its initial object, presenting to the senses as well as to the understanding the almost inevitable impression of the feeling that it seeks to communicate. So again, he's talking about these original languages, and he's imagining that they're they're kind of a language of feeling um, that um, that doesn't have as many articulations, uh, and uh, that is able then to to better kind of communicate sort of this immediacy of, of feeling and passion, right? Um, 
in general, he's kind of, um, he's sketchy on his evidence a lot of times. I mean, he'll, he'll point to something, or he, he, he talks about this here, where he says, oh yes, the, the languages, the first languages um, would be different because of this focus on feeling. He doesn't really, he's at a loss a lot of times for pointing out, well, what, you know, what do we point to in order to, 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 to demonstrate this? But, I mean, this is a problem with any theory of the origin of language in a sense, because we don't know what the first languages were like. It's really, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, there's very little evidence that we can point to that we said, oh, yeah, this is, this is how the people spoke back then, right? Uh, and so y either you end up with, like Rousseau, who um, does a lot of sort of, um, I guess, sort of thought experiments about how uh, language must have been, or you, or you point to uh, examples of what you imagine might be early kinds of language, and right, and so you know when when Warburton does it, uh, you recall he looked at the Bible. He says, "Oh, that's that's like an ancient language, and maybe that'll tell us something about original language." And Rousseau is doing kind of the same thing, right? Um, and part of what he does, though, is he's looking at languages in the present that he feels are somehow more originary languages, right? So in this section about the first languages, his evidence, um, and it's, it, you know, it's hard to find his evidence, right? Because he, he's got lots of claims here about what, these, what this kind of language would look like. Uh, but it's all in the footnote that he actually points to something, and he points to Arabic, right? And he says, it is said that the Arabs have more than a thousand different words for camel and more than a hundred for sword, right? Um, you know, I, I don't know if he knew Arabic, and so I don't know, I can't, I, <coughs> I, I don't know Arabic myself, so I can't really judge that, but it does seem like kind of just something that he kind of just pulls out of the air, right? This, this kind of example of Arabic being uh, a language that uh, uses lots of different words for one thing, and also being a language that's somehow indicative what, of what the first language would have been like. Um, and so, um, it's not clear why he would refer to a particular language as, in, you know, in the present or his present as being, um, you know, evidence for what the first language would be like. Um, but we're going to get that in, in, in well, he, he, so in addition to naming Arabic, at the end of this passage he said it would resemble Chinese in certain respects, Greek and Arabic in others, right? So he's saying that these first languages were probably like Chinese, Greek, and Arabic. It's not clear why, right? Um, but he does seem to have this idea that certain languages are, um, are like the earlier languages, right? Um, and so let's get to the, some little explanation for why he, he would d do that, right? Um, he imagines that there's a, a kind of progression, a natural progression in language. Um, and so we already saw how he, he talked about um, you know, th this movement from giant to man, sort of, sort of feeling to articulation and reason, right? Um, so, and he says that this, this development is a natural one. So the claim here that he, he lays out here is that the more uh, the words become monotonous, the more the consonants multiply, that as accents fall into disuse and quantities are neutralized, they are replaced by grammatical combinations and new articulations. So just what we were talking about, right? So the, these cries of passion, um, become language through the, the addition of articulation, of sort of creating of these interruptions of these differences within the language, right? Um, and um, this, this kind of language becomes then something more rational and less passionate. And this progression, he says at the very end, and this I think is kind of like his warrant, is that um, the progression seems to be entirely natural. So he, uh, and if you remember, this is in con that you can, we can understand natural in contrast to uh, revelation as, uh, uh, that, that Warburton gave us, right? So it, it's a natural development, which is to say, he says that just with the idea of language, you already get this development, right? And so it's, it's natural. It's, it, has, it has to occur this way, sort of out of the, you know, out of thinking through the idea of language. And so it'll always happen this way. So it's, it's a natural development. Whereas with Warburton, you recall, he really focuses on the fact that it's really God teaching humans language. And so it's not natural, in fact. It's really something very artificial because humans would not have been able to learn it by themselves. So it's, it's something that has to be revealed. Right? So that's revelation. It has to be revealed to humans um, through some kind of act of, of teaching, right? 
And so um, Rousseau is really, I guess, you, I guess you could probably say he's sort of consciously distancing himself from that idea by saying it's a natural development, right? As soon as you have this, you know, as soon as you have humans, they're going to they're gonna develop language on their own. It's a natural thing for them to do. It, they don't have to be taught, right? And so um, he's emphasizing the naturalness of the development as opposed to the revealed character uh, of language. And, and in that sense, you know, he wants then to place all individual languages into a kind of universal trajectory of language. Because if it's a natural development, then all languages must be following that same development. There wouldn't be, um, yeah, the, you, you, could, you could somehow imagine different languages s all on the, in, the, in the same process, right? Um, right, and then and the reasoning here, so you know, if, the, if the claim is um, that, that languages move from cry to, you know, cries of passion to um, precise definitions and grammatical combinations, then the reason is only time is necessary for these changes because it's a natural development. All you have to do is wait, and every language will go through this process. Yeah?